From a and this is Biography. There has never been a preacher quite like Dr. Robert Schuller. There has certainly never been a global television ministry like his. You know, of the longest running television programs in America today, the top three are news programs, Meet the Press, Face the Nation, 60 Minutes. But the fourth longest running series is a weekly church service. For 29 years now, the hour of power with Robert Schuller. This is the day that God has made. It's as if he had a great big magnet. He walked into the room and sucked you into it. It's just like, uh, like a train. <laughs> you came along. He's a great financial wizard. I think if he'd gone into business, the world would have heard as much of him as it did because he went into ministry. And he can turn the hurt into a halo, the star into a star. It's the equivalent of McDonald's. I mean, if you want to hang on a shingle and say, I'm, I'm selling feel-good theology, fine, but just don't call it Christianity. You know, my father is always expressive about everything. I mean, if he said, I love you, I mean, he said, I love you, you know. I will build my church. One of our country's best known pastors, Reverend Robert Schuller, suggested that I read Isaiah 58:12. The California Reverend Robert Schuller has had the year of presidents and world leaders. Schuller took his message of self-esteem and feel-good theology first to a drive-in movie theater, then through masterful marketing to a crystal cathedral spun of 10,000 panes of glass. Schuller's Hour of Power is seen in almost as many countries as the United Nations has members. Quite a journey from the confines of a small Midwestern farm. The wide sky and empty plains of Iowa shaped Robert Schuler's vision from childhood. Survival on a farm in the 1920s depended on daily devotion to hard physical labor. We had no electricity, uh, no running water in the house. It all had to be carried in. We milked cows, we uh, had our own hogs and eggs and chickens. So it was uh, a, a very humble and uh, modest life that we lived. The last of five children, Harold Robert Schuler was born to Anthony and Jenny Schuler in 1926. The Schulers were of Dutch descent, and like most everyone else in Alton, Iowa, worshiped at the Protestant Dutch Reformed Church. My dad was a gentleman. He was so humble, very kind, yes, yeah. Mom was um, a wonderful person, too, but uh, you had a toe the mark with Mom. Robert inherited his commanding personality from his mother, Jenny. She was a confident, outgoing woman, and Robert, too, showed few signs of Midwestern reticence. He knew how to talk and, uh, and to show off. Despite Robert's gregarious nature, the family had no real social life. The only respite from chores was church. The Calvinist sect was as stark and strict as an Iowa winter. And in the Schuler's home, it dictated daily routine. We'd always sit by the table as a family and have devotions, scripture and prayer before and after. That was a must, always, never failed. The pride of the devout family was Robert's uncle Henry. Henry was a missionary to China, and in a town where most residents had never even seen Chicago, Uncle Henry was as mysterious as a movie star. He met me at the farm gate and he says, so you're Robert, are you? You're going to be a preacher when you grow up. And he was my hero, and he was a missionary in China. If he said it, he knew something I didn't know, so I bought it, hook, line, and sinker. The trap was set. And from that moment on, Robert never wanted to be anything else. But then, he wasn't exposed to many other possibilities. We were not allowed to have a deck of cards in the house. I don't think we ever owned a deck of cards. We are not allowed to. 
And we didn't have a radio either for a long time. I don't know how many years. We didn't even have a radio. The Schuler's family church frowned on frivolous pursuits and preached John Calvin's 16th century theology. Well, I think he grew up with a sense of um, man being unworthy of God. The un in other words, the, un the un general unworthiness, um, sense of sin, a need for salvation. Ordinary labor was honored as a means of proving one's worth. And every day on the Iowa farm, no matter what the weather, there were cows to be milked and tended by the young Robert Schuler. He found he had a captive audience. There was a time when he had to go get the cows from the back of the pasture, and he wasn't coming back. Well, the cows are coming home, but he wasn't. But he was out in the back of the pasture, yet, sitting on top of a high bank and pretending he was a preacher. He preached to the cows and practiced his delivery by bellowing sermons across the Floyd River. All agree young Robert wasn't cut out for farming. You can usually tell if, if a kid is, uh, would make a good farmer or not. He would really stick out his hand and help right away, and uh, Bob didn't do that. In school, Robert wasn't much like his quiet farm boy friends. He wasn't sought after in sports, but in debating, drama, and singing, he was a standout. Outgoing and confident, with a playful sense of humor, he would play any role on the stage, even that of a woman. He made good grades, and in 1943 was accepted at Hope College in Holland, Michigan, to pursue his dream of ministry. Schuler paid his way working as a janitor and picking up laundry at the dormitories. Robert came home for the summer of 1945. The family farm was hit with a calamity of biblical proportions. We were just home a little while. And uh, the tornado dropped in the distance. We saw it coming. Yeah, you couldn't mistake it. It was like a slithering snake weaving with its head preparing to strike. The tornado blew everything away, everything. There was nothing, I mean nothing, as if a huge vacuum had come and taken it all. And then my dad hit the steering wheel with both fists. My dad gets out of the car and he said, Violet, I lost everything. I don't have anything anymore. He said, well, we still have the land. Schuler's father bought a broken down old farmhouse for $50 and pulled apart the nails and shingles and used the parts to build a new home. Out of nine families who lost their farms, the Schulers were the only family to rebuild. His family's resilience would become a recurring theme in Schuler's sermons. Schuler graduated Hope College with a degree in psychology and prizes for oratory. He entered the Western Theological Seminary, also in Michigan, in 1947. Now he spent his summers in the pulpit, traveling Iowa as a substitute preacher. Bob Schuler hadn't given much thought to girls, but one warm spring morning in 1948, he opened a church door and found a pretty teenage girl playing the organ. Her name was Arvella DeHaan. A little while later, he comes over to me and he says, Arvella DeHaan, he said, man, he said, I was in church and I met Arvella DeHaan. Does she go with anybody? No, I don't think so. Well, man, do you think she'd go with me? I kind of think wouldn't be any problem. That very night, he wrote a friend that he had met the girl he wanted to marry. When Robert returned to the seminary that fall, he began to court Arvella in a relentless letter-writing campaign. He even risked suspension by cutting classes to go home and visit her. He'd spent all of his janitor's savings on a diamond ring. And asked me to marry him, and uh, I said, maybe. <laughs> I didn't say yes right away, because I, I said, I don't know how. I don't know how to be a uh, pastor's wife. I had heard stories of how they expected you to be perfect. So he sent me a book, and in the book it said how she never wore makeup, you wear black, always had a spotless house, and, and uh, I said, I can't be this kind of a person. No, thank you. <laughs> so then he had to convince me that I could just be me. Robert graduated the seminary in 1950 and was ordained by the Reformed Church. Two weeks later, he married Arvella DeHaan. 
They planned on a conventional life in the conservative churches of their youth. But the church Robert Schuller would build would defy all convention. As he had once preached to cows, he would soon be preaching to cars at a drive-in movie theater. By 1950, Robert Schuller was finally an ordained preacher, but his first posting wasn't much to boast about. He was called to a tired old church in a Chicago suburb that only served 60 families. Schuller and his young wife, Arvella, had their first child, Sheila, and barely enough money for milk. I remember one time they needed money and they no, had no money for groceries. So he found some postage stamps that he bought, a, probably a roll of stamps, and he thought, I'll trade them in at the post office. Found out you can't do that. What Robert Schuller could do was put his natural gift for salesmanship to work, knocking on doors and persuading people to come to church. In just five years, he had doubled the congregation. Schuller's drive was noticed by the leadership of the Reformed Church. They asked him to try to start a new congregation in California. California at that time, for us at least, was kind of a wasteland. He confessed to me that he had the same fear that I did, which was that if he went to California, nobody would ever hear from him again. Nevertheless, the Schulers rented an organ, packed up Sheila and their new baby Robert, and set out for the West Coast. In 1955, Garden Grove, California was a burgeoning new town, serving an economic explosion in the aeronautics and electronics industries. Welcome. Disneyland is your land. Walt Disney was breaking ground in nearby Anaheim to serve up family entertainment. Orange groves were being uprooted for freeways, and thousands of transplanted families were arriving in their cars. But Schuler faced tremendous obstacles. There were only a handful of members of the Dutch Reformed Church in all of California, and he was told it was impossible to find a hall in Garden Grove to hold services in, even if he did find anyone willing to attend. In an exercise of what he'd later call possibility thinking, Schuler pondered locations for services ranging from mortuaries to Masonic lodges. He started making phone calls. He struck out on nine out of 10 of his possibilities for a meeting hall. But the 10th possibility, and the most outlandish, was available. The Orange County Drive-In Movie Theater could be rented for $10 on Sunday mornings. Schuler built a pulpit and a 15-foot cross to erect on top of the snack bar and bought a microphone and a trailer to haul Arvella's organ. The Schulers advertised at the drive-in between movies and handed out flyers all over town. The ad said, come as you are in the family car. The church elders were not amused. Well, the night before he was to begin his first service in the drive-in theater, one of his neighboring pastors came by and said, I can't believe you're doing this. And Schuller said, doing what? He said, you're holding church in a drive-in theater in that passion pit? And so we were not only, well, not, I don't know, frightened, but, but really concerned because this was our denomination and realized that they were very embarrassed about this. But it was too late. I just kept encouraging my husband to, let's do it. Let's find out, you know, if it isn't, if it isn't good, we'll drop it. Schuler knew the appearance of success was as important as the real thing, and he was afraid he'd be preaching to an empty parking lot. So he invited a choir from another church to perform and requested that each member come in their own car to pack the lot. Schuler's marketing paid off. More than 50 cars showed up on that sunny Sunday morning in 1955, and the church collected their first offering of $86. Week after week, Arvella bravely played along whatever the weather. Later on in one of the Sundays, we had a Santa Ana wind and the trailer tipped over and I held on to the uh, organ and my music went flying, but it was fun. Mean, uh, I think immediately because of the people who came, there was a lady who had loaded her husband in the car. He had six months left to live from cancer and she made a bed for him in the back seat of his car. So we, we just right away had people who needed the drive-in. The church elders backed off as Schuler's experiment began to succeed. 
Schuler christened his new ministry the Garden Grove Community Church. It was generic labeling designed to be non-threatening. He discovered that the drive-in appealed to a great many who hadn't set foot inside a church in years, who wanted to worship almost anonymously. I put on my jeans and my t-shirt and headed off to Garden Grove. I think it was, um, for me at the time, like a private way to worship God, and I didn't have to prepare for it. Drove in, did my own little thing, drove out. Like his uncle had before him, Schuler became a missionary in a strange land. Going door to door, he did his own primitive market research, polling people about what they wanted in a church. And so many of these people, uh, like himself and like us, um, were transplants to California. And for a lot of people, it was an opportunity to begin life anew and as you wanted it to be. I can go to church if I want to, or I can forget it if I want to. Schuler decided that calling people sinners would only drive them away, literally. His sermons began to accentuate the positive, good news about God's love. I was raised with thou shalt not, then thou shall. <laughs> You know, uh, everything was a sin. Uh, life was a sin almost. And to go from that position to knowing that God loves you and hearing that a lot was very, very refreshing and hopeful. Schuler began to draw people who had forgotten or abandoned their own religious traditions and were attracted to his positive, guilt-free approach. He had found his market niche and soon the parking lot was overflowing. In just a year's time, he was able to parlay several small donations into a down payment on a small, new, traditional chapel just a few miles from the drive-in. Reverend Schuler could finally get off the roof of the snack bar. But as it turned out, many members of the congregation still preferred the drive-in. So now Schuler preached two sermons a day, one indoors and one out. But Schuler now had a vision of even greater expansion. To attract attention, he knew he needed a big drawing card, a national celebrity. When the going gets tough, let the tough get going. Another Dutch Reformed minister, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, was the best-selling author of The Power of Positive Thinking. Schuler idolized him and quoted his work often. He sent Peale an invitation to preach in California. In his letter, he craftily described his beautiful outdoor church, neglecting to mention that it was in a drive-in theater. Well, it didn't make any difference to Norman. Uh, Bob Schuler had had some signs made, Norman Vincent Peale in the drive-in theater on Sunday, the date given, and he put these on the telephone poles all the way up the highway. I thought, my goodness sakes, he knows how to advertise. More than 2,000 cars jammed into the lot, baking in 90-degree heat for Norman Vincent Peale. What, what a Sunday. The entire drive-in was filled, all of the cars, and then we didn't have enough room. There was a backup down the freeway. There was one freeway, five all the way through, and that was backed up for miles. I'm very deeply moved this morning to look out over this vast assembly of people of Southern California. This is a great experience, and I'm very happy to be here. The event was a high watermark for the congregation. Peel's presence gave Schuler's ministry the affirmation he had been looking for, and the Garden Grove Community Church underwent another burst of growth. The response fueled Schuler's instinct to adopt Peel's positive thinking, but he had to come up with his own name for it. Schuler made a slight alteration and called his theology possibility thinking. One time I had a little conversation with him and I said, now look, Bob, uh, Norman Vincent Peale has positive thinking and Robert Schuler has possibility thinking. So you both go along parallel, but you have a different phrase that you use. When Schuler's sermons steered away from the subject of sin, some conservative church members thought he was diluting the message, but the unchurched Californians he was courting loved it. He was now in full flight from his Iowa upbringing. In 1958, Arvella gave birth to another baby girl, Jean. Though the family was living more comfortably on a minister's salary, they were by no means well off. 
and Schuler seemed to never stop working. There were times when I'd like to go golfing with him or so, but as he says, he, does, he has no time for golf. He never really turns off church. It's never turned off. And the Reverend was frustrated. He was exhausted from running from chapel to drive-in, and the congregations were jealous of each other and growing apart. It was at that time that I remember him going through this, where he would just, just walk around the house. He would just lie on the a sofa and just think and think and say, I don't know how I'm going to solve this problem. Schuler even considered leaving the ministry altogether. He needed an inspirational idea to save his ministry. He came up with an ambitious new building plan. The same service would be held in the pews and the parking lot. New freeway-friendly real estate would cost the church more than $66,000. And a tab that high had to bring criticism. Oh, you're just, uh, your motives are all, uh, you just want to build something big for yourself. You want to build a monument for yourself. And I questioned his motives about this. The congregation held a special meeting and almost half voted against him. The next morning, Schuler received the resignations of most of his staff. And I was crushed. I stood up and prayed. I don't remember the words. All I can remember was something came into my brain. It was a verse from the New Testament. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But I heard it like I had never heard it. I heard it with the emphasis on, I will build my church. It's not yours, Schuler. It's mine. Wow. And I said, okay, Lord. And I pointed to my desk chair and said, do it may I take a vacation? And I heard, yes, go ahead. Schuler told his board that from now on, Jesus Christ was the chairman of the board. And to demonstrate his point, he left an empty chair for him at meetings. Few could argue that Schuler's ego was at stake if the new church was the will of Jesus. Whether through divine intervention or strategic savvy, Schuler would build his new church. In November of 1961, Robert Schuler dedicated his walk-in, drive-in church. It was a sweeping glass structure that, like the drive-in, welcomed in the sky above. Half the congregation was inside in pews. The rest listened to the sermon on the AM dial of their car radios. The church had 1,700 parking spaces. Schuler called it a shopping center for God. But the combination church and drive-in was no tacky compromise. Schuler had commissioned Richard Neutra, a visionary modern architect, to realize his inspiration. Schuler was again banking on the hope that the appearance of success would breed more success. And the church did look sleek and successful, and so did the Reverend. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. He was thinner and he had had nose surgery to alleviate a swelling condition he blamed on his poor diet as a youth. The Schuler family continued to prosper as well. In 1965 and 1967, two more daughters, Carol and Gretchen, arrived, making a family of seven. Within two years, the walk-in, drive-in church had grown so fast that Schuler was preaching to 1,000 people every Sunday. I thought it was uh, one of the California fads and uh, however, I wanted to return again because of the message. As his new church began to thrive, Schuler's message was becoming more finely tuned. Belief that with God, all things are possible. Instead of the message of man's unworthiness he'd received in his own childhood church, Schuler began to celebrate strong self-esteem. Change your mental environment, and you change everything. The message uh, being, uh, that uh, the human dilemma is no more serious than a little bit of tinkering with self-esteem won't fix. And above all, God really loves us. God is somebody you can plug into, like a, a, a power line, or uh, God is somebody you can call on who will help us like ourselves a lot and give us things, good things. 
and above all, to be a success. And practicing this, what we call in this church, possibility thinking. Obstacles become opportunities. Irritations become invitations to be higher and better and bigger than you've ever been before. And Schuler practiced what he preached. In 1967, he published his first book, Move Ahead with Possibility Thinking. Sales were so strong, it is still in print today. Schuler had a knack for the snappy phrase. Slogans made his sermons palatable and easily memorable. And he can turn the hurt into a halo, the scar into a star. The Reverend's one-liners turned out to be crowd-pleasers, but he sought an even broader audience. He consulted with Reverend Billy Graham's television producer and made another risky decision to put his own church on TV. However, Schuler knew nothing about the business, so he turned to his wife. But he said, there's one thing I need from you. I need you to run it. And I said, you what? <laughs> And I said, you've got to do it. Because he said, you know worship, you know music. I don't know anything about television. No, but you could learn. And with that, he turned around and walked out of the house. Welcome to an hour of power. With Arvella as the executive producer, Shula went on the air in 1970 from his sparkling, telegenic glass church. Already the master of distilling spirituality into sound bites, the gray-robed minister was a natural. We have a major problem of mental pollution of negative thinking. Schuler himself compared his TV program to religious kindergarten. Life can be different. Life can be better. Life can be wonderful. Religious observers have agreed the fair is light. It's the equivalent of McDonald's. Uh, you go, you get what you want, and you leave. You make no connections with anybody in the building. I'd say that's pretty darn good because that's basic. You got to give them the basic stuff. Give me a hamburger. Don't try it making it a French restaurant. Give me solid food, cheap. That's good for me. God could come down this morning and present a beautiful golden gift to you, and if you could open it, out would tumble two words. It's possible. It's a very saleable set of ideas that he's putting forward. It's just that they don't have anything to do with Christianity. I mean, if you want to hang on a shingle and say, I'm, I'm selling feel-good theology, and you can come, but I, it's fine, but just don't call it Christianity. Yet even though Schuler seemed to be moving away from his Calvinist roots, members of his Dutch Reform denomination supported their most famous son since Norman Vincent Peale. Times change, and we do change, and I think that he is just creating a new vocabulary, a new language for the presentation of the Christian message. The Hour of Power was a powerful conduit for Schuler's message and the best advertisement for his beautiful church. Again, the membership ballooned, and Schuler began to feel the walk-in, drive-in church was increasingly inadequate in size. The man who had begun life as a simple Dutch farmer's son wanted to build his own American cathedral. And he wanted Philip Johnson, one of the master modern architects of the 20th century, to design it. As usual, Robert Schuller knew exactly what he wanted. I wanted the dim religious look. He wanted the parking lot look. He said, said the ministry, Philip, is something where you connect with the world. It's a thing that's connected with everyday life. He says, I preached all these years from the top of a truck to a, in a parking lot. So I know what that feeling is. Uh, to con contact people in the most uh, primitive way. The model Johnson constructed was light and airy, based on the shape of a star, with 10,000 window panes made of leaded glass. Schuler was ecstatic, and he named it the Crystal Cathedral. It wasn't crystal, nor technically even a cathedral, but it was a catchy name. Schuler had told Johnson not to be limited by cost because he didn't have the money yet anyway. Now he had to raise it, an estimated $15 million from scratch. In the 1970s, Robert Schuler's Hour of Power dominated religious programming. More than a million viewers tuned in each Sunday. The Hour of Power provided Schuler with the perfect forum to promote his latest dream, 
building a crystal cathedral. The price tag was initially estimated at $15 million. Reverend Schuler would ask donors to buy windows for $500 each with their names inscribed. The difference would be made up by individuals donating $1 million each. He started talking about his idea on TV. And uh, parenthetically, pause now for station identification. If there's anybody that wants to give a million dollars, we will, with great humility, accept it. The donations started to arrive in bundles, and ground was broken in 1976. Schuler ran a smooth fundraising operation that was computerized early on. From the beginning, letters were carefully screened and sorted by paid professionals to ensure personal replies to those that required it. The ministry consistently received an average of 20,000 letters a week, most containing donations. During the construction of the Crystal Cathedral, Schuler's world seemed blessed, but he was about to do his share of suffering. In 1978, his family faced an horrific tragedy. His 13-year-old daughter, Carol, was in a motorcycle accident. The athletic teenager had her leg amputated below the knee. Carol's long and painful recuperation was a heavy strain on the whole family, especially on her mother. You know, I was so weak, I'd gone down to 80-some pounds, and I was 5'7". Um, she had to lift me in and out of the bathtub. She had to wash me. She had to, when I did come home, I look at her and I think, oh, she was just so taxed. Arvella and Robert basically lived at the hospital with their daughter. The same year, Arvella was struck with breast cancer and underwent a mastectomy. I think my breast cancer came, though, because of Carol. I really believe that. Uh, and it was because uh, of the pain that we had to witness day after day, month after month. Schuler would often share his family's troubles with the Hour of Power audience. We got in an accident and... Um, and you, you landed in the ditch. Mm -hmm. And uh, before I go any further, I think I have to say, whose idea was it that you were to be my guest today? Mine. Yeah, yours, yeah. <laughs> was it my idea? You're doing terrific. And uh, I mean, do you, do you have anything you want to share with them? Well, all I can say is just keep on turning your scars into stars. And I didn't prompt that line. Will you please tell them that? I didn't tell you to say anything, honey, right? Right. At the time, Schuler was also under enormous pressure to raise an extra $5 million needed to complete the Crystal Cathedral. Despite his family's crises, Schuler kept calling on donors and pushing towards his goal. You still go to work and get on with the job, and that's not being noble, that's not being extraordinary. It's just milking the cows. They gotta get milked. Never been a farmer who skipped milking because his wife died that morning. Within a year, Schuler had raised the funds he needed to finish his cathedral. On May 13, 1980, the Crystal Cathedral opened its 90-foot doors. It was an architectural triumph that heralded a new era in Schuler's ministry. The parking lot preacher had created a new American phenomenon, the mega church, and it could seat 2,700 worshipers. In the end, the Crystal Cathedral had cost more than $20 million. The church has defended itself from critics of the cost. People look at that and say, $20 million for a building, why? Why not give it to the poor? If you gave $20 million to the poor, it would be gone tomorrow. This will stand, I hope, for hundreds of years and will be an instrument to raise a lot more than $20 million for God's work. The account books for the Crystal Cathedral came under scrutiny by California tax authorities in 1983 because Schuler had claimed religious exemptions from money-making activities held at the church. Aerobics classes and psychotherapy were questioned, as were the Christmas pageant extravaganzas. The shows were so popular that the Crystal Cathedral used Ticketron to handle sales. The church's tax-exempt status was temporarily lifted. But considering the church was taking in more than $30 million yearly, it could have easily paid the property taxes in question. Oh, if we had to write the check out today, I would put our heads together, we'd have a little prayer, and we'd come up with the check. I have no doubt about that. The state eventually ruled in favor of the Crystal Cathedral, and all the fines were returned. 
Now Schuler began churning out inspirational bestsellers year after year and stopped accepting a church salary. Though he would not disclose his income, he was living well on book royalties and fees for motivational speeches that commanded up to $20,000 for an event. That's what he was paid to cheer up laid off General Motors workers in Flint, Michigan at the bottom of the recession, which America saw in the cynical documentary, Roger and Me. Tough times don't last, but tough people do. Just because you've got problems, it's no excuse to be unhappy. Schuler's own tough times were coming to an end. Arvella and Carol both had remarkable recoveries, and Carol even became an expert skier. And in 1984, she carried the Olympic torch with pride. But the period of stability for the Schulers was not to last long. And we hope all of the people we love so much will forgive us. And in 1987, sex scandals struck televangelism. Big name TV preachers, Jim and Tammy Baker and Jimmy Swaggart, came under fire for corruption. Suddenly, every television ministry was suspect. We lost probably 25% of our audience and 25% of our income overnight. The press zeroed in on the Crystal Cathedral. How much damage has what happened to Jim and Tammy Baker and what has happened more recently to Jimmy Swaggart, how much damage has that done to Christian ministry as a whole? I uh, happen to believe that enormous and probably irreparable damage has been done. But, but despite many probes and public forums, no wrongdoing at the Crystal Cathedral was uncovered, and Robert Schuler rode out the crisis. Now and stand by in the bell, stand by to dissolve cross. And by 1988, the hour of power had 2.5 million viewers in the United States and was the most watched religious TV program. And Schuler's feel-good message was making him a certified celebrity and raising his public profile. But Reverend Schuler was on the verge of gaining power well beyond the pulpit. Dissolving bells now. As he approached his 70th birthday, Reverend Robert Schuler was spending more and more time globetrotting to build his international audience. By 1990, the Hour of Power was even the most watched program in the Soviet Union. Pastor Schuller is a pastor of the Church of the Reformed in California. Schuller was robust and in good health. Then, in 1991, during a visit to Amsterdam, a simple bump on the head getting into a car almost ended his life. Rushed into the hospital, he was in a coma, and they did a um, brain scan, and he had this tremendous subdural hematoma, and they said, we're gonna have to operate or he's gonna die. The church board held an emergency meeting and designated Schuler's son, Robert Anthony, now also a minister, to take over the ministry. Recovery and rehabilitation took almost a year. He was like cerebral palsy when we took him home. He couldn't really walk, couldn't remember. He we didn't know people. And then meanwhile, our board was saying, you must get him in front of the cameras uh, because people will wonder, is he OK? And uh, so we had that. That was a tremendous amount of tension, I think, and uh, to get him up in front of the cameras. And I have to tell you, I stand before you today as the only minister that's had his brain vacuumed. <laughs> I mean, there were some negative thoughts. I couldn't get out any other way. So I said, well, let's give it a vacuum job. Reverend Schuler was soon back in the public eye, which increasingly meant mixing with the stars of politics. Sure, because if you run for president again and you get elected, I want to make sure what, you remember I treated you well. That's what you call possibility thinking. Yeah, it's called Throughout his career, Schuler had remained pointedly apolitical and non-controversial in the pulpit. But he had befriended politicians and presidents from all sides. Much of America was unaware of the influence Schuler had quietly amassed. That would change on Christmas Eve, 1994. President Clinton was in a valley of his presidency. The Republicans had just swept Congress, and his popularity was ebbing. On impulse, 
Schuler picked up the phone and called the White House switchboard. The president returned the call within an hour. The president is not one to ignore someone who has such a large audience. And I think that's why he called back. The two hit it off immediately, and Clinton invited Schuler to the White House. Um, there is a, a kind of relationship between the two. They both speak highly therapeutic language. The president feels your pain. Um, Schuler's Christianity is basically a pain reliever. For Clinton's second inauguration, Schuler sent him one of his favorite Bible verses. And at the State of the Union address, Reverend Schuler was seated next to the First Lady. One of our country's best known pastors, Reverend Robert Schuler, suggested that I read Isaiah 58, 12, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. It was totally an impulse. So I am a person of divine destiny. I think I was divinely directed. Uh, he was talking about building bridges. I took him at his word. That would provoke the subconscious to think of this Bible text. You shall be called a repairer of the breach and a restorer of the paths to dwell in. Schuler had previously been inspired to share the verse with Jesse Jackson and Yasser Arafat. But the president embraced it as his own, quoted the verse frequently, and said it inspired him to reach out to Bob Dole after the election and award him the Medal of Freedom. With Schuler's growing fame came adverse publicity. A spat with a United Airlines steward wasn't settled on board, but went to court. A male flight attendant pressed charges against Schuler for allegedly shaking his shoulders during an argument over the contents of a fruit plate. As a result of this assault, I have suffered injuries both physically and psychologically, and I have been unable to return to work, to the work that I love, or even go to the airport for fear that I might be assaulted again. Schuler made an apology and paid a small fine of $1,100 to the Federal Aviation Administration. The steward sued the Reverend anyway, asking for $5 million. But the poor publicity hardly slowed him down. Today, the Crystal Cathedral is rapidly buying up neighboring real estate with plans for a full-service entertainment center that will include a movie theater, food courts, and the ever-important mega-sized parking lots. And in a surprising development, Robert Schuler stopped calling himself a Christian, but a, quote, follower of Christ. By rejecting the Christian label in favor of the more generic follower of Christ, he hoped to appeal to non-Christians in a global television market. And that's why Muslims, by the millions, are my friends through my television audience. That's why uh, Roman Catholics, by millions, it's simply to increase an audience. I go back to St. Jerome, avoid like the plague a clergyman who is also a man of business. Yet few doubted his message would be spread ever wider, least of all, Reverend Schuler. So I think that the religion of the next century is, is breaking loose. I think that I am going to shape it. I hope I will have that power because I know we can create a community of people of faith who will get off of their collision course into a coalition of working together to turn human beings into being beautiful people. Reverend Schuler always had a keen sense of the mood of the times, and his vision for the next century will predictably capture the prevailing currents. I think we are living in a bull market for spirituality. I would guess that he's tapped into it intuitively. He simply found a way into uh, the American spirit. Robert Schuller's favorite song is The Impossible Dream. Appropriate, for this is a man who has spent his life having impossible dreams and making them come true and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. He hopes his son Robert will take over his ministry one day, but not for a while. Robert Schuler would like to continue in the pulpit for another 10 years, into his 80s.